Hello everybody, my name is Zachary David and I am a third year PhD student at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. My presentation today is entitled Metabolic Rate of Two Coexisting Ursidae Species, Asiatic Black Bears and Sun Bears. And I will be presenting some of the data that I've collected so far for my PhD thesis. Metabolic rate is a fundamental property that reflects the total energy demand for all aspects of organismal function anything from immune performance to reproduction. Energy balance is determined by the total amount of energy an animal consumes and how much they expend. Survival and reproduction depend heavily on an animal maintaining this energy balance, so the amount of energy an animal is expending, or its metabolic rate, is incredibly important. Metabolic rate can be broken down into two primary categories, resting metabolic rate and active metabolic rate. Resting metabolic rate reflects the total amount of energy an animal needs to maintain normal body functions, such as growth, reproduction, breathing, and blood circulation. Active metabolic rate, on the other hand, is the total amount of energy an animal needs for activity and movement, uh, such as migration, foraging, and social behavior. Combined, these two aspects represent field metabolic rate. I primarily focus on resting metabolic rate, and I'm interested in what factors affect a species-specific resting metabolic rate. One of the major determinants of resting metabolic rate is body size. Resting metabolic rate scales allometrically with body size, and one of the classic examples of this is to compare the RMR of an elephant and that of a mouse. While an elephant is much larger than a mouse and overall needs much more energy, if you compare the mass-specific metabolic rates, a single gram of mouse tissue will require significantly more energy than a single gram of elephant tissue. When comparing the metabolic rates of different bear species, it is important to know what effect their different sizes might have. Diet also tends to have a large effect on resting metabolic rate. Carnivores, such as this polar bear, tend to have relatively higher metabolic rates. In contrast, herbivores, such as this giant panda, tend to have relatively low metabolic rates. Large-bodied insectivores, such as the sloth bear, also tend to have lower metabolic rates. And then omnivores, such as this American black bear, tend to have more intermediate metal metabolic rates. My two study species are the sun bear and the Asiatic black bear. They coexist in some portions of their range and have very similar life histories, which is interesting from an ecological standpoint about how they can coexist peacefully. There are a couple differences between these bears that might affect their metabolic rates and could help explain this coexistence. One, for example, is that the sun bear has a much smaller range than the Asiatic black bear. They live exclusively in Southeast Asia in tropical climates, while the Asiatic black bear has a much larger range. While this bear does live in Southeast Asia in tropical and warm areas, its range also extends fairly north into much cooler and temperate climates. There is also a significant size difference between these bears. The sun bear is much smaller, weighing roughly only 40 to 60 kilograms, while the Asiatic black bear is much larger, weighing anywhere from 90 to 130 kilograms. They are both omnivorous and feed primarily on fruit and insects, but the sun bear has been found to be slightly more insectivorous than the Asiatic black bear. Here is a map showing the geographic range of the sun bear, primarily in Southeast Asia in warm tropical climates. The yellow areas are where we know that they live, and the purple areas are where they possibly might live. The Asiatic black bear, while also living in Southeast Asia, their range extends latitudinally north throughout China, Japan, and a small portion of Russia. It is much cooler in these parts of their range than in Southeast Asia, which might create a difference in metabolic rates across this range. Where I've circled here is where these two species coexist, which is almost the entirety of the sun bear's geographic range. My study site is at the Cambodia Bear Sanctuary, supported by Free the Bears, which is located within the Phnom Tamao Wildlife Center. Free the Bears is an international wildlife nonprofit that does a lot of rescue and rehabilitation for bears that have been illegally taken from the wild for the pet trade, bile farming, or poaching. This specific center that I work at houses over 120 sun and Asiatic black bears. I measure resting metabolic rate using flow-through respirometry. 
We built this plexiglass chamber that is completely sealed, except for three ports at the bottom for air to enter and one port at the top for air to leave. Each bear is placed inside for between 30 to 45 minutes, and while it is resting, I measure the amount of oxygen it is consuming and the amount of carbon dioxide that it is producing. This allows me to calculate how much energy they are using throughout that time period. This figure shows some of the data I have collected so far. This is sun bear resting metabolic rate during the summer. On the x-axis, I have individuals. Two have been measured so far during the summer. Resting metabolic rate is on the y-axis, measured as milliliters of oxygen consumed per gram per hour. Each symbol represents an individual measurement, so each of these bears has been measured twice in the summer. Now for comparison, here is the same figure but collected during the winter. Individual 1 and 2 are the same bears from the summer figure, and individual 3 is a new bear. Comparing individual 1 and 2, we can see that individual 1 has a slightly higher resting metabolic rate in the winter than summer, and individual 2 has a bit more variation in the winter than in the summer. However, if you take the mean of these values, they do line up pretty well. We've also been able to measure one Asiatic black bear so far. We have three measurements on this one individual that was taken in the winter. One of the first things I noticed is that there appears to be a lot less variation as opposed to the sun bears. This might be due to differences in levels of activity during measurement between these two species. I determine resting metabolic rate based on the lowest amount of oxy oxygen consumption when the bear is at rest. Once inside the chamber, the Asiatic black bear would immediately sit down and barely move for the entirety of the measurement. However, the sun bears would be fairly active at the beginning and then calm down towards the end, so this might be slightly inflating their resting metabolic rate. Now this figure is taking the data I have collected so far and comparing it to previously published resting metabolic rate values for other bear species. On the y-axis, we have the same measurement of resting metabolic rate as on the previous figures, but on the x-axis, now instead of individual, it has each bear species. Right now, it is just showing the data I have collected on sun bears and Asiatic black bears. And now we have giant pandas, American black bears, sloth bears, and polar bears. One of the things that jumps out to me most when I look at this figure is how much higher the measured values are for sun bears and Asiatic black bears as opposed to the other species. Like I mentioned at the beginning, resting metabolic rate scales allometrically with mass, and since sun bears are quite a bit smaller than the other bear species, this could help explain why their mass-specific RMR would be higher. The Asiatic black bears, however, are roughly the same size as a lot of these other bears and are omnivorous like the American black bear, yet their RMR is a bit higher. My current hypothesis for this has to do with their geographic range. Like I said earlier, their range extends latitudinally quite a bit from hot, humid, tropic areas to cold, snowy, and temperate areas. Since I am measuring the resting metabolic rate at the southernmost and hottest part of their range, these bears might not be incredibly well adapted to the extreme heat and may need to raise the resting metabolic rate slightly in order to maintain thermoneutrality. One confounding variable that might come into play with these data is activity level, like I mentioned earlier. When measuring resting metabolic rate, ideally we want the bear to sit completely motionless for an extended period of time. As I'm sure you're all aware, bears don't really listen to us when we ask them to do things, and some movement is inevitably involved. I did record each run uh, with a video camera, and I'm currently working through a way to quantify the amount of activity during each measurement in order to determine the effect that this might have. Additionally, these data were collected over the course of two field seasons, where a large portion of that time was spent uh, primarily on logistical efforts in order to allow this research to happen. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic began right after the second field season ended, and we have not been able to get back to Cambodia since then. Hopefully soon, I will be able to be, uh, collect more data on these bears to make these inferences a little bit stronger. I would like to acknowledge a couple great organizations that have really helped out throughout this entire process. Primary funding has come from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, as well as from my home university, Old Dominion University. This project would not have been possible without the generous cooperation and coordination with the organization Free the Bears. 
I'd also like to thank the Cambodia Forestry Administration for allowing us to conduct this research. Finally, I'd like to thank my PhD advisor, Dr. John Whiteman, who has been an incredible mentor throughout my time as a graduate student. Thank you so much everyone for watching and I can't wait to hear what you all think. Hi everyone, my name's Kirsty Officer. Um, I've worked as a vet with captive bears in Southeast Asia for several years, most recently with Free the Bears, um, which is an organization focused on providing sanctuary for Asiatic black bears and sun bears um, intercepted from the illegal wildlife trade in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm also, as part of a PhD, currently investigating the occurrence of human origin tuberculosis in captive sun bears. <clears throat> Um, so today I'm going to be talking about humans as a disease risk to bears, and um, I'll use TB as an example of a human pathogen that poses a, a clear risk to the health and welfare of, of captive sun bears, um, and also think about whether there are any um, broader conservation considerations. So the term pathogen spillover um, has gained um, a lot of much needed attention over the past um, year or so. And it can, it sort of falls into three broad and very much overlapping categories. So zoonotic disease, which is animal origin human disease, um, it needs an animal reservoir for maintenance and most of these come from domestic species. Then there's emerging infectious diseases. So um, previously unknown diseases where a chance event allows them to become established and, and easily spread within human populations. Um, and the SARS coronavirus 2 is a good example of, of this. And then what I'm interested in is reverse zoonosis or a spill back, which is um, when disease spills from humans to animals. Um, and of course, SARS coronavirus 2 has been shown to be capable of doing this. And another well-known example is, is mycobacterium tuberculosis. So the bacteria that causes human TB around the world. Um, and there's also been, um, it's been shown to be capable of causing disease in a number of animal species. And these are often sort of sporadic or incidental occurrences in um, often captive wildlife where individual animals have been put in contact with um, in infected humans. Probably the most well-known example is elephants where human origin TB has become increasingly prevalent um, in the past couple of decades and, and more recently and concerningly, um, it's been detected in, in free ranging individuals. So just thinking more broadly about whether pathogen spillback poses a risk to free ranging wildlife populations. So while the consequences are potentially great, it's considered fairly unlikely. Um, so just because it can occur doesn't necessarily it will it, it means it doesn't mean it necessarily will occur. Um, but there's also been not a lot of critical analysis about that risk. So there's a lot of uncertainty around um, the drivers of a potential spillback event. Um, so what the pathogen factors, host factors, environmental factors might be that um, could precipitate such an event. And if we think about it in terms of, of sun bear conservation, you know, we know that in Southeast Asia, the risk is dwarfed by other human driven threats. Um, and, you know, we've got to be careful not to overstate the, the risk posed by disease, but by the same token, we probably shouldn't ignore it altogether. Um, and particularly in those, um, the sort of regions where we have that kind of unfortunate combination of, of vulnerable bear populations, increasing human encroachment, um, high levels of human infectious disease burden, um, limits to veterinary disease surveillance, high numbers of captive bears, um, and you, um, you know, rewilding um, as a potentially, um, rewilding as a potential future conservation initiative. Um, so thinking about where, where evidence could come from, so laboratory experiments are difficult to justify ethically in most wildlife species, documented transmission in free ranging populations, which um, is also very difficult in a lot of wildlife species, um, for instance in sun bears we have very little existing knowledge even of naturally occurring diseases. 
So we're often left with incidental transmission in captive populations. And while this can be quite sort of niche in terms of the environment and the opportunity, it still demonstrates a susceptibility that could be significant and, and should be considered in, in risk analyses. So what do we know about bears? Um, we know that captivity is itself is a disease risk for bears. Um, so it's more likely to put them in contact with other species. And there's numerous examples of um, diseases in bears that have occurred due to pathogen spillover from, from other species. So when a, the, the primary host is put in contact um, and the pathogen jumps to bears as an um, uh, as a new host and causes serious disease. So this is usually as a result of being put in this sort of unnatural contact with other species. We also know that across Asia, there's high numbers of bears in captivity, putting them in direct contact with people. And well-known examples are the pet trade, the, you know, um, the bile extraction industry um, and ex-dancing sloth bears. Um, and it's also important to remember that that contact with humans is all the way along the capture, trade, confiscation and, and rescue continuum. So close contact with humans continues um, in legal captivity and it's often a, an unavoidable part of the way that sanctuaries are, are currently managed. So along with high captive bear numbers, uh, South and East Asia region accounts for 44% of the world's human TB cases. Um, and the occurrence of human origin TB in sloth bears has been known for a while with the close contact that dancing bears in India <clears throat> had with their owners is believed to be behind the high number of cases seen in, in sloth bear rescue centers in, in that country. Um, with most cases, thought to be infected prior to rescue. Um, but TB is now also being confirmed in sun bears, um, along with an Asiatic black bear at our Cambodia um, bear sanctuary, where there's now been 30 sun bear cases, um, which comprises 67% of sun bear deaths at that sanctuary since the first case was confirmed in, in 2009. So, Pathogenic mycobacteria can have this sort of ability to remain dormant in the body um, and um, not develop into disease until, um, uh, until the immune system becomes compromised in some, for some reason down the track. So there's this kind of um, pool of potential disease um, in, in animals that have been potentially exposed. So it, it makes it a very, very difficult to, to manage. And it's also extremely hard to detect infection when it's in that sort of latent or subclinical form. Um, in humans, immunolog immunological testing is used, um, but often that, um, that can be um, species specific. So when, um, so it can be challenging when the disease is detected in new species and particularly in under-resourced um, settings. So this makes it a challenge to manage and it makes it extremely difficult to rule infection out. So this has obvious consequences for management and for planning, um, and particularly if re-release of disease-free bears is, is a goal. And then once active disease develops, it's invariably debilitating and progressive and increasingly contagious. So looking in a bit more detail at, at our situation. Um, so our work has confirmed that all 31 cases at the Cambodia Bear Sanctuary were caused by um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the human TB bacteria. We've also shown through preliminary genomic work that the cases can be grouped into just two infection chains, chains with apparent um, spread between bears within the sanctuary. So um, in some of the other species that have had known infection with um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, they kind of act as dead end hosts and there's not a lot of onward spread without um, reinfection from, from, from humans. Um, but um, so the spread within sun bears is not, it's not totally surprising in, in groups like this, which are, which are bears that were within the same enclosures for, um, for, for years at a time. Um, so that's not surprising, but we also have a, you know, a few mystery cases where the, the, the chain of transmission or the opportunity for transmission is not really obvious or clear, and they may be separated by, um, by time or physical distance, which um, makes it puzzling as to how, the infect, how they've become infected. 
Um, and we've also shown that there can be up to a six year lag from a any possible infection event to um, the manifestation of, of, of TB disease. And finally, we've shown the apparent involvement of a human case within the sanctuary with um, a genetically matching infection uh, um, within one of our um, clusters. So, um, and there's also some uncertainty surrounding that case in terms of um, the timing and direction of transmission, which is really important for us to work out um, whether we, ha we, we have sort of zoonosis and reverse zoonosis happening. Um, so we're hoping to unravel some of these uncertainties as we get more genetic sequencing done on the isolates and um, learn a bit more about how this pathogen behaves um, in this species. So in settings such as ours, we know that this particular human pathogen poses a significant risk to captive bear health and to welfare. Um, we know that biosecurity measures must consider human pathogens um, and that human health screening is a really important management tool for us. And then thinking more broadly in terms of um, um, sun bears more generally. So this evidence of susceptibility and transmission, it's an important first step in assessing any risk. Um, it's also really important for driving improvements in our ability to detect cases, so um, which will hopefully in turn make it easier to know how widespread this type of spillback event is in other settings, um, make it easier to conduct surveillance and disease testing, and also to be able to better manage the risk within our own sanctuaries. Um, it raises awareness for opportunistic surveillance in the future in other captive and, and possibly wild populations. Um, and finally, um, it's really important evidence to inform the way that bears are managed in terms of their um, exposure to humans and to potential um, hu human pathogens um, if rewilding events are to become a possibility in this and, and other susceptible settings in, in the future. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, in closing, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank the Forestry Administration of Cambodia and the veterinary staff at the Cambodia Bear Sanctuary who collectively remain on the front line of um, protecting sun bears from this disease. Thanks very much. My name is Tia Beckschoft. I am a staff scientist with Polar Bears International. And I'm here today to tell you about the essential role of zoos in supporting conservation relevant to polar bear research. Now, this talk is relevant to anyone working with polar bears or wanting to work with polar bears in the wild or in a zoo setting. So over the past 40 years, Hang on, let me start this. Over the, for over the past 40 years, scientists have overcome tremendous logistical challenges to studying polar bears in the wild, uh, or in situ, as that's also called. Uh, this research has provided essential information uh, on polar bear movements, distribution, population trends, life history traits, basic biological needs, um, knowledge that has greatly added to our understanding of the bears uh, and the challenges that they're facing. However, there is still much to learn about polar bears, including vital studies that simply cannot be conducted in the wild. Uh, traditional research methods can be invasive and expensive, and deteriorating sea ice and less predictable weather also means less stable uh, conditions for field work. So only by developing new modes of research can we really keep expanding on the knowledge that is key to producing accurate estimates and projections of all the impacts that the circumpolar polar bear populations are facing. Some opportunities uh, are really exclusively found in zoos, uh, including the ability to train bears for voluntary blood sampling, as we're seeing here. Uh, zoo bears can be sampled multiple times over a longer period of time, and they can assist in essential calibration and validation of new methods and technologies. So when combined with information from polar bears in the wild, this kind of research really can generate, 
generate vital input to future conservation and management decisions. So these are some of the examples of in situ, ex situ conservation relevant research that has been done or is going on right now. This one is an energetic study um, where the O2 consumption was measured from a polar bear doing various behaviors, uh, walking, swimming, and resting. And then that data was applied to bears in the wild. Then we have these, um, new tracking devices uh, that are very small. They fit within the palm of your hand. They're much less invasive than the traditional uh, collars and can be applied to a wider range of polar bears than the traditional collars. And these were of course tested and developed using zoo polar bears. And then they are um, um, used on bears in the wild afterwards. Then we have this, uh, it's a whole range of papers. The one from 2007 is the first one. Uh, it's about whisker spot patterns in polar bears and how they can be used to identify individual polar bears. That of course is also a method that has been developed in zoos and then applied on bears in the wild. And then finally, very now, um, Jennifer Stern and co-authors have a conference poster that I really encourage you to go look at and talk to Jennifer if you have any questions. Um, hair, polar bear hair, is really widely used right now for studies of um, polar bears in the wild, of their genetics, their diet, their hormones, uh, their pollution load. Um, however, an accurate interpretation of the hair data actually requires an understanding of the time frame of hair growth. And this is what uh, Jennifer is working on right now uh, with the aid of bears in zoos. So those are just a couple of examples. There are so many more because we have a lot more to learn. So I really just want to tell you that zoos play a fundamental role in conservation relevant research moving forward. Now, in acknowledgement of this, uh, the role of zoos, uh, in the recognition of the enormous potential that lies in combining knowledge from wild bears and zoo bears, there are two groups that have been established fairly recently uh, to help facilitate this kind of in situ, ex situ research collaboration. Uh, there is the AZA SSP Polar Bear Research Council or the PBRC. Uh, that's the oldest one of the two groups. And then we have the EASA Polar Bear EEP Research Working Group. Now these two, uh, the EASA uh, group was only uh, established one to two years ago, depending on how you calculate it. Um, these two groups, they obviously work mostly in their own geographical area, but we're also seeing more and more collaboration between them. And I will go into one of the projects later on uh, that we are actually collaborating on uh, right now. So the two groups, the PBRC and the EEP Research Working Group, they are here to guide, facilitate, and support conservation relevant research in zoo bears. Um, they use standardized application forms and provide project feedback from a panel of polar bear in situ and ex situ experts that ensures that the project is applicable to relevant conservation issues. And it also increases project feasibility to have this expert uh, feedback. The groups also connect zoos and researchers and maintain an overview of the ongoing polar bear uh, research being done in zoos. And this creates this knowledge, this, this yeah, knowledge bank really creates opportunities for synergy and for an increased sample size that there perhaps wouldn't be otherwise. And finally, the groups uh, are building capacity within member institutions so that these institutions can actually participate in these prioritized scientific efforts in the years to come. Um, and also 
this whole collaboration enhances project and institution visibility and reach. So if you want to know more, this is just a really quick run through of what the two groups really, why they exist and, and what their purpose and aim is. And if you want to read a little bit more about it, I suggest that you Google what is in the uh, bottom left corner here, the PBRC Polar Bear Research Master Plan. What you will find right now uh, is the version from 2018, the first version. There is a revised version in the works and it should be out in January. So yeah, find that and you will find so many more details on everything I've already just told you. One of the joint efforts that we're working on right now is a polar bear biobank. Uh, the aim is to develop a standardized polar bear tissue sampling protocol to be used in zoos and to establish a long-term polar bear tissue bank for use in future ex situ and in situ research projects. So, so that's research projects in the wild, but also in zoos. And the reason why we'd love to have this biobank is because zoo polar bears offer this beautiful rare combination of accessible samples and a known life history, a known medical history. Um, and so the information that we learn from analyzing tissues collected from zoo bears together with those collected from bears in the wild really help in establishing baselines of health, uh, disease, and just basic biology. Um, doing this also provides unique data that helps researchers understand the levels of exposure and effects of pollutants, pathogens, noise, all sorts of environmental factors on polar bear health in the wild as well as in zoos. So um, this is just to show you that in the wild, if we do have a polar bear in hand, a sedated polar bear in hand, these are the most, some of the basic samples that we will take uh, from that sedated polar bear. So these are, this is just an example of what we would love for you to collect if you have your polar bears in for say their yearly checkup, right? Um, so even if it's, if it's samples like this, if you can con um, collect them and contribute them to a polar bear biobank, it would be incredibly valuable. Uh, for future research projects. So this was the last slide. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or whatever, <laughs> I just want to say hi, uh, please do join the Q&A session that we have. It's on se September 22nd at 11.15 a.m. Mountain Time. And also contact info, very important. If you want to know more about the Polar Bear Research Council or the Polar Bear EEP Research Working Group, please don't hesitate to contact either Amy or Marina. Uh, their emails are listed here and they would be very happy uh, to tell you more about the groups, to hear about your projects, to see if they can, um, uh, if they can connect you with other people working within the same field. Uh, yeah, so just keep in mind that zoo polar bears and animal care professionals are really fundamental to zoo-based polar bear research and that this research can provide essential knowledge uh, if we combine it, particularly if we combine it with information from polar bears in the wild. Uh, so that we can generate this vital input to future conservation and management decisions. So thank you for your time and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Okay, so good morning, <laughs> good afternoon and good evening. Uh, hope I satisfied all the time zones. Welcome to the XC2 conservation session. Uh, we have our great speakers with us, ready to take uh, all kinds of questions from you. I see that we are a group that I guess with no problem can uh, unmute uh, while asking questions, but if we could somehow still keep the order so then you use the reactions and raise the hand 
so this way we can handle a little bit uh, uh, the order how it comes and then let me to just introduce uh, shortly myself I'm your moderator today I'm Agnieszka Sergio uh, working uh, on stress ecology and captive bears in Poland and that's it from me. My co-host is Frank van Manen. Frank van Manen, would you just drop one or two sentences about you? Sure, yeah, I'm the team leader of the interagency grizzly bear study team uh, here in the Yellowstone ecosystem in Montana and Wyoming. Okay, thank you. And then oh, just uh, as the order goes uh, on our session, well, we have Zach with us, Zachary David. So just a few words about Zach. Zach is entering his third year as a PhD student at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. His research focuses on the metabolic physiology of bears in Southeast Asia. His primary interest is in how understanding the physiology of an animal can help inform conservation and management decisions. Zach, could you just remind the title of your presentation? Yes, uh, so the title of my presentation was The Metabolic Rate of Two Coexisting Ursidae Species, Asiatic Black Bears and Sun Bears. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Kirsty Officer, early morning from Australia. So just a few words about Kirsty. Kirsty is a veterinarian who has worked with captive bears in Southeast Asia since 2009. Uh, she is, uh, her current role is veterinary advisor for Free the Bears. Uh, probably everyone knows uh, this NGO with bear sanctuaries in Cambodia, Vietnam and Laos. In that role, she works with and support uh, Free the Bears local veterinary teams at each site. And she says that she currently is stuck in Perth, Australia, trying to undertake a PhD investigating tuberculosis in captive bears in Cambodia while stuck <laughs> during a global pandemic, as mentioned. Could you just, Kirsty, quickly repeat the title of your presentation as it was? I'll be talking about uh, yeah humans as a disease risk to bears to captive bears. Thank you. And now Tia Beckshoft is joining us today from Denmark, having worked in polar bears research for the past fifteen plus years. She is now a staff scientist with Polar Bear International. In addition to studying polar bears in the wild. Tia is also focused on supporting in situ ex situ collaborative research by being involved with the ASA Polar Bear Research Council as well as the EASA Polar Bear Research Working Group. Tia, could you please just repeat the title of your talk? Uh, yes, it was The Essential Role of Zoos in Supporting Conservation Relevant Polar Bear Research. Okay, thank you, everyone. So here we are to open the discussion. So questions and answers session. So yeah, uh, everyone attending, uh, the floor is yours. And so for the speakers, so has anyone has the first question or, or I can ask mine. Okay, I don't see anything yet. So can I have a question to Kirsty then? Because, okay, or, okay, I will just uh, leave it to, to Raz. Raz, could you unmute yourself please and start? Okay, yeah, it looks like I won't be able to start video, but um, hello everyone. Okay. And I'm curious, I, 
I see some really neat work being done now by by folks in this uh, in this session and and some of the audience and it's really encouraging. I for those of you who don't know me, I work for the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, but uh, my focus is really on on um, conservation of of Andean bears in the range countries in Peru. And it's really neat. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start video. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but um, it's neat to see some of this work going going on. And um, I was just wondering what those of you who are successful in this, um, if you have advice for other people that might want to start similar work, or what are the what are the best approaches that you've seen in order to be successful in this? Who would you like to take the question first? Okay, so Christy, I see your willingness. <laughs> Um, I don't know about willingness and I don't know about success, but um, <laughs> um, and it's, yeah, I think, um, I think the question more generally about um, uh, conducting research in captive bears to help inform conservation, I guess it's that, that's more broadly the question and how to, if other people can um, enter into that as a career or as a field, um, is that is that what you're asking, Russ? Uh, just generally, I mean, there's there's definitely value there, at least in terms of certain kinds of projects. I'm wondering, uh, just generally, though, if someone else were to, for the first time see some of your presentations and go, wow, that is really cool. I want to try that. Um, what is something they should be aware of that they might want to do before, before saying, OK, I'm going to do a master's study on this, or I'm going to jump right in and, and plan a PhD program? What is something that they may want to think about uh, right off the bat? Oh, gee. <laughs> um... So yeah, I think just a, a, a passion for for both conservation and and captive animal management in a as a broader term, um, I think is really important if you're going to yeah enter into that sort of uh, work. Um, one thing I would say is there's just there's so many opportunities out there for and you know a need for people with a willingness to do these sorts of projects. So um, that's the other thing that I would say is just yeah seeking out where the work's needed and what sort of work is like. I think yeah with captive bear work and captive bear related research. I think just knowing what's um, important and able to be translated into useful um, data and information is also, uh, yeah, really important. I think from my perspective, a practical, having a practical and um, a practical end goal, I guess, is, is important. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. No, I, Tia here, I completely agree with you, Kirsty. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, I would say that if you're working with either researchers or uh, zoo staff who have not been, been doing this in situ, ex situ collaborative research before, you need to set off time to actually understand where the two groups are coming from. Because everyone is in this to benefit the bears, uh, but, but they are coming from from two different worlds, two different angles. So I think really being aware that you have to set off time to foster these relationships uh, is quite important. And I think I would be back off that a little bit with, you know, so from, from my perspective, I'm, you know, third year of my PhD, I'm still very new. Um, when I was an undergrad, I wanted to be a zookeeper. So I did a lot of zoo internships. I had a very intimate relationship with zoos. 
Um, and then after undergrad, I graduated and did um, a lot of wildlife technician research jobs. So I kind of saw the complete opposite side where it's just purely field research with wild animals. And so I, I agree exactly with Tia where it's like, you know, it's a great, you know, now I'm going into, um, you know, captive research um, and having a good perspective for both sides of it, I think is, has been very helpful. Yeah, thank you. I guess um, I was trying to think of why it is this question in my mind. Um, and I guess it's because different times, either students or potential students in the US or in Peru, they, they have a passion for bears and they want to do research and they want to know what do they need to do to, you know, what can they do? And, and I have a perspective based on my experience in San Diego, but that's only one zoo. And so these interinstitutional collaborations that some of you have, um, yeah, I was just curious about about how it might be different. But it sounds like it's it's pretty similar to my experience. Is that understanding the the interests and the priorities and the opportunities and the constraints? If you can straddle both worlds, is great. But not everyone can. Okay, true. Uh, thank you for this comment also. And uh, if, if we are on this uh, interface ex situ, in situ, and how it translates there and back, I would like to ask Tia, uh, Tia, sorry, the kind of practical question, how, how what, what is the plan about the biobank? I find it really, really interesting and needed, but then how would it work? would it be centralized or somehow spread out? And then what about preserving and keeping, maintaining the collection yeah. and then how it would be to, to, to really use those samples, uh, so, let's say, or someone external, sorry, sorry. Yes, no, that is a brilliant yes. and very central question, right? <laughs> for, for any kind of tissue biobank. Um, now in Europe, uh, there is already the IASA Biobank, which has storage facilities and storage hubs um, in, I think, four or five different countries. Uh, so there's already this, um, what do you call it, this backbone, this, this um, organization that we can sort of jump on board with. And a lot of the paperwork they have also, for example, regarding usage of the samples and whether the usage is destructive or not and about ownerships of the samples and things like this, they already have a lot of paperwork in place. Now, obviously we need to adjust that. So, you know, it's polar bear relevant, um, but, but there is this whole structure in place that, that we can, you know, that can really help us here. Um, in the US, as far as I know, there is nothing similar, nothing uh, either sent. Well, I mean, there are a lot like at the San Diego Zoo, you have the frozen zoo. So there are many, several uh, smaller, excellent biobanks, um, but not to the extent of like the samples that we would like to collect from, from the polar bears. Um, so, so, I mean, this is one of the main challenges uh, working in AZA uh, as compared to IAZA. But, but here in Europe right now, there's this excellent opportunity to kind of uh, work together with the already existing biobank. Okay, thank you, excellent. Uh, and if you don't mind, can I jump quickly to Kirsty to ask also some kind of practical question? Is there any program in place for the screening? Like uh, I know that TB is not that uh, somehow straightforward in terms of if it's this kind of latent, no symptoms really, but do you screen for some zoonotic problems or like uh, when the bear is admitted then what kind of samples you, you take and then how, how it looks this and kind of standard check screening? Um, yes, good question. And yeah, as you already alluded to, it's really tricky with um, 
with tuberculosis in particular, just because it does have that ability, um, so an animal can, you know, yeah, be an infected uh, long before they develop active disease. And at that point when the infection is latent or subclinical, it's really hard to detect. Um, so um, that's difficult in humans who, you know, have, for which there's been many, many, a lot of research and many tests developed. So for us, we're dealing with a fairly, um, with a species that for which there's no specific tests. Um, but yes, the gen, so the screening process um, for our bears when they arrive or their initial health check is ideally, um, so a, a serological test, which is not designed for bears, but we've have found some utility with, um, and uh, then just radiography, so chest uh, radiographs and um, actual sampling of the lungs, so bronchial al alveolar lavage. But it's entirely possible that we would miss, um, miss a case, but we do that anyway, just in case um, we, we pick one up. But otherwise, it's that's why we've had to develop a whole sort of management strategy for screening throughout the bears um, time at the sanctuary okay. to try and catch disease as early as possible in that active phase, I guess, before it spreads further. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I was just asking also because like what we do when we capture, we try to routinely also do all, the, all kinds of swabs from all mm -hmm. possible openings. Uh, we mm -hmm. were discouraged at the beginning that it's just waste of money, but then because we have feeding sites and, and some uh, not really natural gatherings of the animal that exchange the food and, and many other things, then, then we do that anyway. So recently we discovered when we screened everything and put everything together that some of our free ranging bears are holding the multi-resistant bacteria uh, actually that are of concern of WHO. So this is one ah. thing that you can also find them to be sentinels really. And there is a certain risk with them being uh, roaming over large areas that they are also carried farther. Yeah. This is one thing. And the other is that our routine is also pseudo tuberculosis somehow, which is more straightforward and simple. And we, we do the screening of free ranging bears for that as well. So, yeah. so just as a comment, and I saw that Lydia, and I, I'm sorry to, to, to somehow go faster. <laughs> as, so I guess you would like to refer to, to something with Tia or some others. So yeah, yeah, I have questions to all of them. And thanks, uh, Agnieszka, that you asked already the question to Kirsty. I also wanted to ask. Uh, but I have another or two other one, uh, questions. One is, how do you explain that mostly the sun bears were affected by TB and just one Asiatic black bear? And what do you suggest for the staff in uh, the staff in in sanctuaries like yours, where perhaps on the in the future also releases are planned, how to to deal with uh, perhaps carriers of the TB uh, in uh, in 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 the employees? How how do you deal with that? Uh, so thanks, Lydia. That, I think the the first um, question about why we've seen so many more cases in sun bears than Asiatic black bears. It's something I'm looking into. Um, I suspect, um, so it may be that sun bears are more susceptible. Um, we know that, for example, you know, the Ursid herpes virus, we see it um, very much in our sun bears and we are yet to find it in, in Asiatic black bears, even though there's a lot of contact within sanctuaries. Um, so there may well be a susceptibility um, preference there, um, but it may also be simple disease dynamics as well, just because the two, um, uh, you know, the index cases were 
potentially, we've yet to show this, um, we need to do more genetic work, but that the, um, the first two cases were sunbears that came infected into the sanctuary. And then it's just because they've been in contact with their groups um, within the enclosures that um, it's spread so um, much further between the sunbears. But, and talking speculatively now, we know that um, the Asiatic black, black bears are just very, um, very good at walling off infections and um, being quite uh, good at not succumbing to diseases, which is why, right, they survive for so long in, in bile farms. And um, so there may well be something about Asiatic black bears that allows them to keep this disease more under check, whereas sun bears, um, yeah, it develops into active disease more quickly. And we've certainly seen that happen, um, yeah, within the sun bear groups. It could also be a stress-related thing. So the, st if the effect of stress on the immune systems, there's, there's many factors and it's one of the things that I'll be looking into. So <laughs> ask me in a couple of years. Um, the other question about screening of people, right? Yeah. So uh, in terms of people who will be interacting with bears that are potentially going to be released to the wild is that's what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess it's a, it is, um, like it's always a risk, but um, certainly the risk of a human passing disease to a bear is so much higher once they have active disease and it's much easier to detect TB in humans once they have active disease. So I guess there would be um, a relatively robust and regular screening of anyone who's interacting with a bear that's potentially to be released, not just for TB, but for other diseases as well. Um, and so, yeah, that's certainly, that's something that should definitely be considered. Um, so, you know, having bears isolated from the rest of the population and removing any risk of them being infected um, prior to the plans to release. And then of course, the people who are coming in contact with them at that time need to be as disease free as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I already ask the questions to the others or shall we get the screen to, to some more questions from other sides? Go ahead, we are free. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Thea, you said in your presentation about the tissue samples that uh, tissues might give us an understanding on the level of pathogens, but also environmental impacts like noise. How can we see that from tissues? Uh, that is the first thing. And the second thing is, if you want to know about the environmental impact, we have, of course, to have a very detailed information from the holders when we collect the data from, um, from, from uh, participating zoos on the environment, on the general environment of the bears, on the diet, and also perhaps if noise can really be detected, long phases of noise, we also have to ask about um, yeah, uh, recent environments. How do you want to do that? You mean, how would I set up? Yeah, what, what do we need to know from the holders if you, we want to assign a certain result of a tissue to a certain environmental impact? Well, it surely depends on the study. So I, I haven't thought that through in details. Uh, when I think about noise and, um, well, the impact of noise, I think about stress and I think particularly about denning, right? Uh, and there are some projects out there. Um, yeah, I'm, 
sorry, I'm not sure how how to answer this question um, because I don't I don't have a particular project set up, so I don't know what people will look into other than reproduction, noise, um, well, auditory signals. Um, I would also like for hearing. In my own personal experience, I would love to see how different contaminant loads, uh, whether that could affect hearing in polar bears, as we've seen in cetaceans, for example. Um, yeah, so there, there's an endless amount of projects. I'm just not sure how to answer this specifically. Yes, but, but, but if we really want to know something about that, we need to know a lot uh, if from, from the holders that they have mm -hmm. to answer us in um, in advance about the environment of their bears otherwise you cannot assign it later perhaps you want yes. to look later uh, have a certain question and are interested uh, oh now i see what you mean effects, then yes. you have to know it from the holders yes so, i understand now you what you have mean to have a very good yeah questionnaire with the samples uh, from from the holders and how to make that in a way that it's feasible for the holders because you know we are all drowned in in surveys. Yes, I yeah, absolutely absolutely. I don't know how you would do something like that for samples that you have in the biobank. You know, maybe you want to do a study like this with samples that are five years old, and then yeah. you don't have that kind of information. Um, for my point, a tissue sample, well, if we're talking about noise specifically, I would want to compare, just, just an example, I would try to compare the, the inner ear of a polar bear in the wild with the inner ear of a polar bear in the zoo, right? And look at um, the facilities that the bear has been in, not the, so it's not the single stress event that would be meaningful here in, in this hypothetical project. It would be more the, the long-term stress effect of, of wherever this bear was kept, uh, how many visitors there usually was at this point in time, how the enclosure was built uh, at that point in time, and these kind of, of factors. But I understand what you mean, and you can't really do a, a retro perspective retrospective yeah. um, questionnaire for something like that. No. So obviously even biobanks have limits. Yeah. Um, but just having these samples would open to a much wider range of questions than what we're able to answer right now for the snapshots that we usually get from bears in the wild. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, can I just as a comment, maybe it's an idea worth exploring that the, every tissue in the biobank carries the, the really wide questionnaire <laughs> somehow with it, so then everything can be somehow um, found in there. But I guess it would, it would be probably more effort to answer this than, than collect the tissue and preserve yeah. it. I, I, I think I, so. Cool. I think so. Because but, you do not only have a place where to store the tissues, but also to have a place then to, to store and to, um, uh, to administer these, uh, these, these answers. So it's not, mm -hmm. not that yeah. easy. And it, it depends a lot on the study you're doing, because if I have samples from a wild polar bear, then there is usually I wouldn't need that detailed information on the zoo bear. I would need the medical history, the life history, um, but I wouldn't need to know, you know, the number of guests or how, yeah, like, like single instances of noise or other kinds of disturbance. I wouldn't need that to do that tissue comparison. Um, but if you're talking about which, you know, these samples can also be used for zoo to zoo comparisons uh, or, you know, doing a review of 
dermatitis, for example, which is an mm -hmm. issue for a lot of, of uh, zoo polar bears, then yes, it would be good to have more information like this, much more detailed. Okay. Okay. Uh, and and my my last question uh, concerning the physiological study on sun bears and Asiatic black bears. First of all, how do you uh, define winter and summer in a tropic in the tropics? Uh, and um, secondly. Did you do some crate training with the animals which um, were used in your uh, first uh, studies in the first animals? And how did you um, select the animals? What were the criteria uh, uh, for, for selecting the animals? Okay, Zach, before you go, I just wanted to say that I support the second question about the training. I also had the question for you about that. So I second. Gotcha. <laughs> Perfect. Go ahead. Uh, so for the first question, as far as summer and winter, um, there is a very, where we are in Cambodia, there is a slight temperature difference um, between December and May. So I just selected the hottest month and the coolest month in Cambodia. Um, it is only a like two to three degree on average uh, difference between those two seasons. Um, so even though it is the tropics, there is a slight difference. Um, and then for the crate training, um, I don't do it uh, personally, but the staff at Free the Bears um, before we arrive uh, train the bears that we've decided to do the measurements on ahead of time to go into um, transfer cages that they already use to move bears within, you know, in between different enclosures. Um, and then for our setup to get our measurements, we have that large plexiglass chamber that I had a picture of in my presentation. Um, and we have it on a, a really big pulley. It's raised up above the ceiling. Um, and then we get the bear inside the transfer cage, um, which they're completely fine with doing most of the time. Um, and then we just lower the chamber down on top of them. So they're inside their transfer cage uh, the entire time. And then what was the third question? I think you're muted, I'm sorry. Okay, Lydia, we don't hear. What were, what were the selection criteria for your test animals? Uh, adult, healthy, and that was about it. Um, we have Free the Bears, uh, the Cambodia sanctuary that we work at has like 120 bears. So we have a really nice um, selection criteria. Um, so adult and healthy are the primary ones. Um, we try to do either gender or either sex, um, but then also behaviorally, um, we try to select the calmest bears um, since we want them to be resting inside the chamber. And that's where we would just defer to the keepers um, because they obviously know the bears the best. So we tell them uh, we'd like adults, adult healthy bears that are essentially the calmest. Um, and then that basically narrowed it down pretty, pretty succinctly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Zach. I see that Ras is holding the hand hand up so please Raz just unmute and go ahead. Yes thank you so I have a, a similar well another question for Zach and that is for your kind of work is it more informative or can you even know at this point to say whether it's for a given investment in in husbandry or for a given investment in sampling is it more informative to have more data points from the same individual or fewer points across individuals? Which variation do you think is going to be larger? Uh, going back to the point about behavior, um, especially because we're trying to get resting metabolic rate, there's a lot of bears that just will not relax in the chamber, will not you know, sit down. Um, so we try to try to get the best data that we can with, you know, as many bears as possible, but that by, you know, only selecting bears that are able to rest and, and chill out in the chamber, it definitely does decrease our, you know, sample size fairly significantly. 
Um, and we have done we have done measurements on a couple sun bears um, that do move around quite a bit, and that creates a lot of noise in the data. And we can't really you know absolutely say that some of these measurements are actually resting metabolic rate since they're moving. Um, so I definitely try to get you know the best data as opposed to a lot, um, particularly with physiological studies. I mean sample sizes across the board and a lot of physiology studies are fairly low. Um, because you need to have very specific criteria to collect it, and it's also, you know, somewhat fairly time-consuming. Um, so it's definitely a lower number, um, but we try to just make sure that the numbers that we are getting are accurate. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Okay, so maybe if I can... Uh, Zach, just to keep you busy a little bit longer. So then uh, the one thing is the behavior. You want them to, to be the calmest ones. Uh, you want them to, to calm down and relax in the chamber. And then uh, like then how, how big is the chamber? And then, and then how long sometimes you, you have to wait until you start measuring. So, so they are somehow down and and chilling in there? So I don't have the exact measurements of the chamber, but it's about, um, you know, it fits an Asiatic black bear and it fits sun bears. Um, the sun bears have about, you know, have room to pace. They can kind of circle around pretty easily. Um, the Asiatic black bear can move around, um, but it's a little tighter for him or for her, the one that we've done so far. Um, but we've noticed, at least, you know, I've only measured one Asiatic black bear so far. Um, but as soon as uh, they got in the chamber, it just sat down, relaxed, started kind of licking its paw, did not care at all. Uh, the sun bears are a bit more energetic. They kind of, once we get them in the chamber, they're moving around, they're, you know, scratching, they're licking, doing all sorts of things. Um, and it typically takes them like 10 or 15 minutes to just kind of relax. We try to just get all noise out of the area and try to just make it as calm as possible. Uh, but the measurements, typically last around 30 to 45 minutes. Um, so even if it takes them about 10 or 15 minutes to relax, it's still not that uh, big of a deal. And we do monitor them the whole time. Um, a couple of them will get agitated towards the end. They're like, all right, I'm tired of this. I don't want to be in here anymore. And so if they get active towards the end of the measurement, we'll just call it off um, and release them back into their enclosure. OK, so I have two more questions. Lydia, can I go? or? Or you would like? Okay. So Last one question. question. Then perhaps mine, mine are covered. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the first one is: Do you control the temperature in there somehow? Is it um, the all the time the same? Because then I guess then when when one bear is feeling it pretty tightly and then another one half of it, then is it somehow? Controlled for. We do we do monitor the measure or the temperature, um, and also it goes it factors into our equations um, to actually get the resting metabolic rate. You need to know the temperature um, for all the sensors, um, and the temperature actually doesn't really fluctuate very much. Um, so we have a fair amount of ambient air being pushed through constantly. Um, I think it's about two hundred okay. liters per minute. Um, two hundred and fifty liters per minute. Um, so there is new air constantly going in there. Um, we've noticed that the temperature will typically increase maybe two degrees, possibly three degrees um, by the end of the measurement, um, but it, it roughly stays about ambient temperature in there. Okay, and the second question is where do, um, or somehow were you curious and, and then monitoring or somehow observing like any stress? Or, or measure it exactly, so then if, if there would be any potential effect on this metabolic rate as well. So we do, we video record all of the runs, um, and something that I am starting to do now is I'm going to try to develop some kind of like ethogram um, to kind of get a quantification of how much they're moving or how much they're, you know, stressing during um, each measurement. Um, but we don't have any like, you know, no cortisol measurements or anything like that. Um, but 
from what we've observed, um, they really don't seem to mind very much. I mean, they've had the keepers there have given them a lot of training to go. They'll train them to go into the transfer cages, um, and then they'll also train them to just sit in there for an hour or two. Um, so they are pretty used to the environment, and it doesn't seem to stress them out very much. But yeah, it definitely, if they were um, highly stressed or if they were moving around, that would affect our um, measurements. So that's why I'm trying to get some kind of you know, estimation on how much they're moving per run. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I, I guess it, it could be maybe worth to try some physiological measurement, just some of them, they have different strategies to cope and, and behave Absolutely. when stressed. So, yeah. So Lydia, go ahead. Um, I have another thank question you. to Usek. Um, did the diet differ between the two seasons or was it the same? And another question, just um, in addition to uh, Agnes Akas questions, what is the temperature in the, um, in the chambers? Because the, the comfort zone or the thermal neutral zone in, in Sun Bears is so narrow. Right. Um, so Kirsty might be able to answer the first question a little better than myself, um, but I believe their diet is constant across the year. Would that be correct? Or do they change it up? Yeah, it's actually, uh, so it does change slightly according to availability, but um, very minimally just because the same things are available all year round um, pretty much. So yeah, no big changes according to season. Gotcha. Okay, and then um, the temperature is typically around 33, 34 Celsius. Um, there has been one paper that was published that um, says that the thermal neutral zone for some bears um, is between 28 and 31, I believe. Um, so it is potentially a little higher outside of their thermal neutral zone, um, but it's not much higher than the ambient that they're already experiencing. Um, so I think it might just have to do with the weather conditions in that area. study, it was uh, uh, between uh, 26 and, and 30 degree uh, measured from infrared uh, and from, um, from the, the behavior of the animals. That was it, right. Okay, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Lydia. I would like to somehow go back to Tia because you mentioned in your presentation this study about the replacement for the collars. So just to go back to that, what is the cost of this uh, smaller device? And if it was already tested in the field somehow, I'm curious. So the cost, I don't know exactly what it is, but it is lower than the, you know, the standard um, collar that that is used traditionally. Uh, and yes, they are being tested in zoos, but there have also been a few uh, deployed in the wild. Okay, and are you familiar somehow about the, the effects of this? This is, uh, I, I guess, kind of into the skin going partly somehow, how? It's, it's not into the skin. They're only attached to the fur itself. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. um, so there are various methods. The one I think that has worked best so far, uh, this is a project that would do, was developed between Polar Bears International and 3M, you know, the company that makes like the stick it notes and everything else that sticks to things. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the version that has worked the best so far is where, you know, um, so the transmitter itself, fits within the palm of your hand. And then this plastic plate, it's not, it's like bioplastics, but this plastic plate that it's attached to, there is room for this bristle brush. So it's like a triangle and there's room for a bristle along all three sides. And you kind of just put that, um, that triangle into the fur and then you screw in those bristle brushes along the side in these tiny tunnels. And they just get so wound up in the hair that it actually just sticks to the bear. Um, and I think 
right now, as far as I remember, this, the triangular one that's been the most successful had, has at least been sitting on a bear in the wild for three months. Okay. okay. Which is, is pretty good. Okay, this would be my follow up how often you, you need to somehow yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, of course, uh, you know, during the molting season, we expect that it would fall off. Okay, and then how easy it is to find it and recover. <laughs> we All will right. see. It now, the, it's been deployed in the population in Western Hudson Bay. Um, polar bears. And this is where there's a lot of field work going on, bar COVID, but <laughs> otherwise every year. So there is a good chance, uh, unless of course it's at the bottom of the bay, uh, of finding it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Frank, you unmuted yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, I might, might jump in. Uh, this is for, for Tia. Um, you, you gave some really good examples of, of work that connects the XC2 work to the NC2 work uh, with polar bears. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit more on, on um, what, was the, what were the important components of that success so that we can learn from that maybe with other species as well. Because I think there's a lot more potential for those type of, uh, for that type of collaborative work. I'm, I'm not sure that, that it's being fully exploited uh, to, to, the, to really, uh, to the advantage of, of uh, bear conservation. So I'm curious okay. about your experience with polar bears. I think there's a lot of potential in the collaboration. And I think there are a lot of people on both sides who are interested in moving forward, but are a little bit unsure of how to approach it. And so this is still relatively new in Europe. This, uh, the polar bear uh, research working group, we only had our first actual meeting uh, this summer, right? So relatively new still, whereas in the North America or in the US where we have the Polar Bear Research Council, um, this kind of in situ, ex situ conservation relevant work has been going on for more years. And so I think the reason why it's been so successful, um, I mean, it requires that you have people who understand the value of the other group. Uh, a lot of researchers have never worked with a zoo and so maybe are not actually aware of the brilliant opportunities that zoos provide, right? And zoos maybe, I've talked to a lot of zoo people who really want to work with a researcher but are not entirely sure what they're actually looking for, right? So you need someone to facilitate uh, the conversation. And then you also need people on both sides, as we were talking about before, who are actually willing to invest the time. Because if you are to train, I'm sure a lot of people here know this even better than me, but if you are to train the polar bear to do anything that it's not used to and do it on cue, uh, that requires a lot of work hours. Right? So you need management who actually sees the value of engaging in this uh, and of, of putting funds into it, right? And for researchers who maybe have never worked with bears who could be trained, uh, this is also a whole new concept that it can actually take months of hard work uh, to get the bear to do that tiny little thing that you need it to do to get your data, right? So yeah, resources, uh, whether that's patience or funding or something in between, but also I think the Polar Bear Research Council is incredibly important and the research work, Polar Bear Research Working Group uh, in that they are there to facilitate this contact. And then I think once more people have been involved in this kind of research, this kind of collaboration, you know, it will be the, the snowball effect. So people will start, start to understand what the usual way of going about this is. And um, yeah, and not hesitate quite as much as I think some people are doing right now. So yeah, give it time. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would say that there is uh, some some process required for all of this, and then especially as, as you mentioned at the beginning, this connecting two worlds and somehow feeling everyone to ha having something to contribute also. Uh, Raz, you raised the hand, uh, so you were first, and then Lydia, please, uh, you will be the next one. Uh, I'd just like to suggest um, a comment, really, and that is that I think what uh, Dea and colleagues have done with uh, the polar bear working group, it is really um, provides a good example, maybe both for for researchers and and zoo professionals alike, it shows that it can be done, and I think that's uh, kind of important because that sort of is an example. Hey, here's this idea you haven't maybe you haven't seen yet. Um, and from my own experience, I'm in the process of going through the approvals process, and to do some small things that have already been done or are being done through this um, working group. And it's really helpful for me to say, you can do this, they're doing it. And the husbandry professionals are like, oh, cool. And I think Jenny Stern is also in this audience. I'm gonna call her out that she's also, the work she's doing, the fact that it's not totally novel for people on either side. I think really, um, the pioneers are opening a lot of doors for us. Okay, thank you, Russ. Lydia, just go ahead with your question. Uh, from my experience as a culture of the captive bear expert team, it lasts sometimes years until the mutual trust is built up and until certain prejudices decrease on both sides. Uh, it is, and as far as I see that, um, you have to start again in each section of the community. In the polar bear section and now in the sun bear, sun bear group, uh, sun bear holders on the on one side and sun bear researchers on the other side, um, uh, working more closely together. And you have to do that for each of the bear species because the different researcher, the researchers are different and they all of them have to find out again, um, despite a lot of talks and despite a lot of questions and repeats um, that Zeus might be a valuable source to uh, for certain questions and as Tia said uh, many colleagues from the field do not really know how much work it might be to bring an animal to that to do what what it should be done that means a lot of um, impact also on the zoo so whenever a project is planned where zoo animals should be included they should be the the zoo community or there's a tax and advisory group or whatever for whatever species um, should be contacted very early so that they can find the right um, participants for such a research and so that we can bring in our um, the 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 our knowledge on which what it takes to do such, such a study my my best example is always that we got um, q tips to get saliva from tigers and bears for genetic research so there is obviously still a lot of thinking that our bear, our animals are pets and we can easily deal with them. Um, and, and there are many of these misunderstandings or misconceptions on what zoo animals are and how they are kept today. We are, do no longer live close together with them, but we try to get a distance and to keep them on a distance. And if we want to change that, 
we need time. Okay, thank you, Lydia. That's an important comment. Yeah, there is, I guess, in, in many cases, we don't really appreciate the effort behind and we, we are not really aware. So keep up the good work in raising the awareness and and repeating and and yeah, be stubborn about it. I just, uh, if you don't mind, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I would like to go back for to, to Kirsty just shortly. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation mortalities that happened due to the TB. Uh, did it happen suddenly or there are the like the the end stage was somehow uh, unnoticed and they died or there were some kind of symptoms a little bit before so it was somehow the cases were expected or how it has been found um, mortalities due to due to tb yeah yeah yeah, it has, um, it has cha changed, I guess, yeah, it's kind of changed over time. Um, initially. Um, so the signs early on, again, bears are really, uh, really good at hiding signs of disease, as you would know well, um, and the signs of TB are very nonspecific until the end stage, so weight loss, um, you know, less activity, um, reduced appetite, which could be a myriad of things. Um, but we've got much better at recognising those signs and testing earlier. Um, unfortunately, it remains... So another thing that I'm looking at at the moment is the possibility of treatment as an option. Um, but unfortunately, at the moment, that it has, hasn't been an option up until now. So, um, and once, once um, bears have TB, it's a progressively fatal disease. So we're now, in terms of trying to manage the further spread of infection, um, if we get a positive, they're euthanized. So in answer to your question, initially, yes, there were some bears that reached the end stage um, and were really quite unwell before TB was diagnosed, but we hope that that's never going to be the case in our sanctuary moving forward and that it will be picked up um, before that. And ideally, uh, treatment instigated, but at the moment, um, unfortunately, it's still euthanasia. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was curious about how, how it looks like and then what would be the intervention. And, and then I guess if it's the end stage already, then yeah, just to euthanasia, the, the last option. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank it's you. Very, I think we've, we've only had one there that's actually developed a cough, which is what you would expect with TB, right? Um, in people, it's one of the main signs. But um, yeah, it's definitely not not a sign. It's just a very slowly progressive, um, non-specific clinical signs. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. I guess we are going to close soon. Just